unless it was the longest drop ever there's no way she's gonna fuck time to have died from a heart attack heart attacks are not like and you're dead it's like oh my arm feels cold or something like that and then you die she the the you know what happens but that was intense bungee jumping i am disgusted Today's video is brought to you by Policy Genius. More on them in a bit. Hello there, welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. I, as always, am your host, Simon. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And if you're new here, what happens? Danny writes me a script. The wildest, sorry, wildly dangerous reality TV shows that were actually real. Uh, I've never read this before. I'm probably familiar with a few of these shows. I think a lot of them, I don't know. I just always feel like Japan, aren't they always up to some crazy with like naked people in a room doing stuff? I'm like, Japan, what's up? It's called hentai and it's art. But then also all porn of Japanese people always seems to be like pixelated. So what's up, Japan? I don't know. I don't understand your culture. Um... That sounds vaguely racist, doesn't it? But I don't. Anyway, let's just get to Danny's words because that's what we're all here for. Right? The small population of the city of Y- Oh, just can you- Can you hear that? Can you hear that? The infidels are back. <laughs> OGBBs, remember, when the people next door on that side were like drilling, drilling, drilling because they turned the thing next to me into a shop. They're doing the same thing on the other side because real estate is in such demands that they just take this, like, I, I, I work in a basement. It's basically like the, it's like a semi-submerged ground floor that was turned into an office. And uh, they, they did it the other side of me, now they're doing it the other side because apparently real estate's in such high demand. Which I guess is good news because it probably means my office is worth more than I paid for it, which is nice. But on the other hand, I'd like to do some f***ing work without the f***ing drilling. Cocksucker. Let's carry on. Oh, it's gonna drive me insane. I don't even know if you guys can hear it, but it's so goddamn loud. The small population of the city of Young in Uruguay very rarely had anything to get excited about, but one day in 2006, the city came to a standstill, and around 1,200 children were given the day off school to enjoy a thrilling special moment by the railway. Channel 10 had come down to film the latest episode of their smash it reality TV show, and thousands of citizens had gathered to watch the unfolding of a... I'm going to surgically remove my own face and then wear it as a mask. God. What the hell is even that? Oh, that was weird. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just out of words to say about how upsetting it is. <laughs> And thousands of citizens had gathered to watch the unfolding of a televisual spectacle that would finally put Young on the map. By the time the cameras stopped rolling, eight people were dead, several more were seriously injured, and various crushed arms and legs were scattered up and down the disaster scene of the rail tracks. Oh my god. <laughs> when you're making a reality TV show and eight people die. Do you guys know the story? There was like a town called Crash or something, which was in America, and they just got these two giant trains, and they were like, let's have them like go full speed towards each other and crash into each other and like shit went everywhere i don't remember if anyone died but apparently uruguay looked at that and were like seems like a good idea let's do that now we'll pop back to uruguay a little later in today's video but you're far less likely to get an outcome like this from a typical gentle british reality tv show called the great british bake-off or the great british sewing bee no i know the great british bake-off is a real thing because i went home to visit my family and they were like we're, we're sitting down like having dinner and like 20 minutes of the conversation was about this thing called the great british bake-off and i'm like one that's an extreme demonstration of how middle class my family is and secondly i had absolutely no idea what they were talking about and at first i thought it was a joke because i'm like surely the most popular show on television is not about people f***ing baking no it was and which is why i don't doubt in any way when danny says that there is a show called the great british sewing bee which seems insane doesn't it after all edmonds as the late late breakfast show accidentally killed off a member of the public in 1986 during rehearsals for a bungee jump stunt which we've talked about before the uk broadcasters went through a period of shying away from inviting their viewers to participate in ridiculously inappropriate stunts but it only took a decade to forget and by the turn of the millennium and the 
dawn of a new era in reality television we no longer had any real concerns over recklessly endangering lives in the name of entertainment in fact when there's a show that doesn't endanger lives <laughs> this is boring why where where did it, where's the death beginning when they run helpless into the streets uh, mowing them down with machine guns i know these views aren't popular but i have never thought it popularity <clears throat> It was even more exciting if the participants dicing with death were superstar celebrities. And well, when I say superstar celebrities, if you're at the very peak of your glittering career, you're hardly likely to accept an invitation to go on Celebrity Chimney Sweep World Tour. Please tell me that's not a real thing. The people who always star in these, it's like, you know, Celebrity Big Brother. And maybe the first one had some people that you'd vaguely heard of. And now it's like I look at Celebrity Big Brother and I'm like, okay, maybe there's one person who I know. And I always feel they put them in the middle of the list to make me think that i'm supposed to know all these other people because it'll be like john smith jane doe john doe um random c-list celebrity oh hi who are you and then some other names and you're like oh i guess i, I just guess i'm out of touch not knowing who these, who these other people are and maybe i am but the bigger question is who the fuck's watching this but for those C-list celebrities beginning to fade from public view, shows like The Jump offered an opportunity to get their faces back on the box while pushing their endurance to its often very narrow limits. Hosted by Davina McCall, I've heard of her. She was hosting reality TV shows in the 90s. This could be an or like early 2000s. This could be a a 90s show. Or a, was she? I, I know her name. I, and it was filmed in Austria. The jump premiered on Channel 4 in 2014 and was billed as seriously scary winter sports in which retired professional athletes competed, along, competed alongside forgotten TV actors in fame-hungry reality stars and events such as bobsleigh, giant slalom, and snow skates. During the grand climax of every show, the two celebrity contestants, lingering at the bottom of the score table, would have to face off in, the sli in a live ski jump to keep their place in the next episode. Well, I'm out of here. Goodbye, everyone. Isn't a f***ing ski jump that thing where people go down that super f***ing steep slope with these giant skis and then go through the air? I was I, I thought this was like one of the most dangerous Olympic sports. And we're just having amateurs and old athletes do it. And it's like, old athletes, yeah, I did this back in the day. <laughs> it's like, now my legs don't work properly. Funnily enough, much like my legs. <laughs> Somebody's going to die tonight. We used to say that Brain Blaze was the only show where you knew that I had working legs. Or legs at all. Now the mystery remains. To show how the ski jump was done, Eddie the Eagle Edwards was always on hand to give practical demonstrations. If you're not familiar with the name Eddie the Eagle Edwards, he's a national treasure in the UK on account of his hopeless performance in the 1988 Winter Olympics, in which he cemented his position as the worst ski jumper in the history of the universe. The only reason I've heard of him is because he was in a movie. What, like, it was a while back. And I'd never heard of him before then, and I've not seen the movie. <laughs> Obviously, I don't watch movies. Although I did recently see Moonfall. Oh my god. <laughs> People will be like, Simon, how the f have you not seen The Godfather, but you've seen fucking Moonfall? And I'll be like, well, let me tell you that Moonfall was that. No, Moonfall was shit. It's the worst movie I've seen in a long time. And I liked, I liked uh, that John Cusack movie by the same director. I know it was shit, but it was kind of, I felt that was, was it self-aware shit or do we just think that in retrospect? That John Cusack movie, 2010 or 2012 or whatever the it was called. Moonfall is, oh my God, is it worse? The directing is bad. The acting is bad. The script writing is bad. The whole thing, what? There's so many technical problems that I could watch that movie. I could watch that movie and I'll be like, unrealistic, unrealistic, unreal. And I'm not just talking about the moon crashing into Earth. I'm talking about like one of the things that bugged the shit out of me is they're all using sat phones, like satellite phones throughout the whole movie. And it's like, guys, guys, the moon is like fuck 100 meters above you. You think the fucking satellites are still working? What the fuck are you talking about? And that doesn't even get into the fact that the moon is some sort of mega structure. And it's like, and, and the guy who discovered it, I feel like he's supposed to be some likable everyman. But he's not. And it's so cringe. And there's this moment where he has a cat. 
and his cat is called Buzz Aldrin, and it just feels like so f***ing awkwardly shoehorned into this movie. I don't know, I'm just watching that movie and I'm just like, ah, ah, why? Don't see Moonfall, or see it. it. It's not even one of those movies where it's so shit that you end up enjoying it. It's just not enjoyable in any f***ing way. I can't believe I didn't just stop watching it halfway through. It's been 84 years. If you think all of this sounds a bit ill-conceived, you'd be absolutely bang on the fucking money. Considering that even experienced professional athletes have died training for this kind of event, it never sounded like a wise idea to encourage celebrity hairdressers, glamour models, and former stars of the only way is Essex to have a go. What's a celebrity hairdresser? That must be a... Wait. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on a second. Are the people who are celebrities because of their hairdressing ability or does that mean like somebody who is a hairdresser to celebrities because surely there aren't celebrity hairdressers am i that out of touch because i'm like that's not right right <laughs> oh my god i don't understand i don't understand bitch I don't Thankfully, nobody actually died, but the injuries gradually piled up over the flagged course of the first two seasons as celebrities rapidly withdrew from their competition with shoulder injuries, hand injuries, and, in the case of former Page 3 girl Melinda Messenger, concussion. The third season was when things started to get a bit silly. Although it was ultimately won by former England rugby player Ben Cohen, there was barely anybody else left to compete by the end of it. Almost half of the original lineup had withdrawn due to injuries including damaged knees, broken arms, hamstring injuries, and fractured ankles. F***ing hell. I, you can see why this show's British, right? Because we just don't sue each other to the extent that the Americans do. And especially, I feel like if you were some, like, washed up, um, what's the f***ing show? That, that piece of crap. I feel like Sam uses memes from it. A Jersey Shore. Oh, uh, If you're, like, some, like, person who was on Jersey Shore, like, seven years ago, and you're doing this, like, reality show to barely get a little bit of that like slice of fame that you once held and you so desperately want to go on to because you've constructed your entire persona around it and and soul then if you get injured you're gonna be like i'm gonna sue the fucking shit out of whoever's making this whereas i feel in the uk we'll be like more fool me guess i did get injured ah. i'm gonna get the part that's what i'm gonna do although i feel like we're generally coming around to getting very litigious which I don't like. And that was just Eddie the Eagle Edwards. No way. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is a lot of injuries, Eddie. No, I'm just kidding. Eddie was fine. What the f***, Danny? You lead me on like that. <laughs> Poor Eddie. Olympic gold medal winning swimmer Rebecca Adling. Olympic gold medal winner swimming. We can't even speak. Yes, I can! Why is that so hard to say? Now, just before we continue with today's video, let me tell you about today's wonderful sponsor, Policy Genius. Look, nobody likes to think about life insurance, because when you think about life insurance, you're essentially thinking about death, aren't you? Which is cheery, but it's an important layer of protection for many families. Indeed, maybe you and your family, especially, but not entirely, if you're a single income household. Fortunately, there's Policy Genius and their award winning policy options that are ranked number one by Forbes. And you've probably heard of Forbes. It's a little bit of a big deal, isn't it? Look, whether you've put off your purchase of life insurance or you just never really thought about it, Policy Genius are the team that you definitely want to check in with. They're a third-party marketplace that works for you, not for the insurance company, so you can trust that their licensed experts are going to give you solid and unbiased advice. And life insurance premiums, they might seem like a financial drain. Well, like lots of stuff's a financial drain until you're like, oh, I really, could eat, really did need that one, did I? But you could save $1,300 or more per year by using Policy Genius to compare life insurance policies. So, if you're interested, head to policygenius.com to get started. In just a few minutes, you work out how much coverage you need, you can compare personalized quotes to find your best price, and when you're ready to apply, the Policy Genius team are going to hand all of the scheduling for you, which is brilliant. 
Save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. And getting covered now locks you in on your rate. And over the course of a 10 or 20 year policy, well, that can be a really big savior. It can really add up. So head to policygenius.com forward slash blaze to get started because when it comes to insurance, it's nice to get it right. And now back to today's video. Olympic gold medal winning swimmer. You're welcome. Rebecca Adlington had been hurled off a 100 meter slope at 30 miles per hour and ended up dislocating her shoulder, an experience she described as being worse than childbirth and literally the worst thing that's ever happened to me. Well, if dislocating the shoulder is the worst thing that's ever happened to you, you've led a fairly cushy life. I broke my collarbone last summer and it's that's by far like it's it was painful and that's not dislocating a shoulder i'm gonna go ahead and say that it was worse i came off a mountain bike at speed uh, i also broke a rib in my front and whatever the f have close to your spine in the back because oh my god it was unbelievably painful but it was by far far from the worst thing that's ever happened to me in my life all right so cool your jets no one says that what the f are you talking about you weird buddy you're weird but the most notable injury during the troubled third season occurred when olympic gymnast beth twiddle collided with the barrier and fractured two vertebrae in her neck beth had to be airlifted to hospital where she underwent emergency surgery on her spinal cord <laughs> cancel this show immediately what the f are you doing you trying to kill us oh, <laughs> and she wasn't very happy about this hold that thought the media kind of assumed that the jump would be axed after finally hitting the bottom of a disastrously slippery slope but a boom boom and here's the funny thing nobody really liked it anyway although channel 4 kept hyping it up as a big tv event the ratings were poor and the critics were absolutely savage Digital Spy reckons that it was more painful than a snowball in the mouth. Again, Digital Spy, have you experienced actual pain? Because I'm like, if someone was like, would you rather have your toenails extracted with this pair of pliers, or would you rather have a snowball in your mouth? I'd be like, I'll have a snowball in my mouth. And does that mean thrown in the mouth, or are you just holding it in there and making your mouth really cold? I get that it's going to be unpleasant, Digital Spy, but holy shit, someone needs to punch you in the nose. If you're a real person and not an online publication. What I'm is assuming is an online publication. I don't really know what Digital Spy is. While well, critic Jonathan Wiley concluded, This is reality TV taken to its limits. Manufactured, emotionless crap, wheeled out through desperate. Uh, excuse me, through desperation. I am disgusted. And yet, despite the pileup of celebrity accidents and a total lack of enthusiasm from the audience, Channel 4 kept on recommissioning the damn thing. The fourth season only threw up a mere four unplanned withdrawals, including celebrated racing cyclist Sir Bradley Wiggins, who broke his leg during snowcross training. I feel like I've read his book. Did that guy cycle around the world? Or am I imagining that? And that was some other doo-doo's book I've read. I think I read this book years ago. My grandparents gave it to me for a birthday or something. Or maybe he was just a... No, maybe that this is the guy that did the... Oh, who cares? This is... See, look, my, I just don't care about sports. I even quite like cycling. I mean, even though it destroyed my body. Uh, but I just, I just don't care about sports. Like, early on in a brain blaze... Uh, which was back then business space we were talking about like mo farah and i was like i had no idea i was like who is she i don't know why i assumed it just in my mind like i was like yeah mo farah is a woman and everyone was like she's not a woman it's a man and i was like okay i just don't care and the name's f***ing mo it's a dude's name i just had it in my mind for some reason that he was a woman which would be totally fine it's 2022 <laughs> people having a go at me you need to get a bit more woke. And it looked for a while as though a fifth season was on the cards until Channel 4 briskly changed their minds at the last minute and officially out the jump without explanation. This may or may not have had something to do with the unhappy Olympian Beth Twiddle who filed a lawsuit. There we go. It's happening. Come on, Boogie, let's burn this motherfucker down. Burn this motherfucker down. Let's burn it. Let's burn it. Against the production company and several ski instructors in 2019, alleging that they were responsible for injuries which had affected her ability to work and for it, from which she may never fully recover, seeking £200,000 in damages, which feels like a very British amount. I'm like, £200,000? Yes, unquestionably a lot of money, but when you read these in America, it's like, seeking damages. How much are those damages gonna be? 
and they'd be like, $200 billion! <laughs> and it's like completely unrealistic, but maybe if you start at 200 billy, you'll end up with 200 milli? Which is still ridiculous. Maybe you'll end up with 200,000 pounds. Beth claimed that she just wanted to make sure that there's full accountability for people involved in creating shows like this. That's the only thing you wanted, Beth. That's the. Uh, can you imagine Beth goes to court and the judge is like, oh, well, we've taken everything into consideration, and what we're going to do is we're just going to punish the company with some fines because that's what you wanted, Beth. Have a great day. And Beth will be like, what about my money? I was just saying that to make my. <laughs> I was just virtue signaling. I want the money. Show me the money! I'm broke, nigga, I'm broke! I hope that didn't blow out this microphone. You can't shout on these quite as good as you can shout on the lapel mics, because they're a little bit more sensitive. Hmm. Yes. I did just put on some perfume. It's Rotten Badger. That's right. Link below. The lawsuit is still going on today, but it's tricky to work out whether Beth will score another triumph, or if she is a little off beast with this one. Should willing participants in a blatantly dangerous reality TV series shoulder some of the responsibility if it all goes a bit tits up or is it entirely the fault of people making the show? As always, it's a spectrum, isn't it, Dano? God, that perfume does smell ridiculously good. And, like, that's the spectrum as well. I'll use that to demonstrate my point. I'm saying that 80% because it smells ridiculously good and I thought of it as I smell it on myself. And I'm also selling it... Uh, and I'm also saying it 20% because I'd like you to buy it. Because if you buy it, it makes me money and I can use that to buy food and sports cars. I would hazard a guess that Beth signed a waiver at some point before putting on her snow boots. And I can't help thinking that if I was ever invited to take part in the all new naked bear wrestling Wheel of Death on Fire, I'd probably give it a rain check and try my luck at wrestling up a banana cream pudding in the British Bake Off tent. That's a little gay. Yeah, but also, you do have this kind of assumption that when someone's putting together a show, that they'll be like, it might look dangerous, but it's actually safe. Like, but although, did you hear that story of the woman, like, bungee jumping? <laughs> She was like bungee jumping in Australia or some shit. And she's standing on the bridge. And then they give her that she's standing on the bridge. I think her boyfriend's next to her or something. And they nod to the boyfriend. And she thinks they're nodding at her. And she jumps off. And she hasn't had that. No, it wasn't in Australia. It was in like South America or something. In Mexico or someplace like that. And uh, maybe she was also. I don't remember the details, but it was crazy. And they, they, she thought they were nodding at her. And she jumped off and had an attached thing and she died. And I'm like, oh my god, that is super intense. And then in the news article, it was like she died on the way down from a heart attack. And I'm like, that's news. Can you do a little bit better of a job of reporting the story? Because I'm sorry, but unless it was the longest drop ever, there's no way she's gonna fuck time to have died from a heart attack. Heart attacks are not like, and you're dead. It's like, ah, 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 my arm feels cold or something like that, and then you die. She. That you know what happens. But that was intense. F bungee jumping. F Eye of the Tiger. Survivor didn't make that much of an impact here in the UK, where it lasted a mere two seasons before taking its last breath. That's largely because the broadcaster ITV felt that it would work out cheaper to create their own rip-off version and rebrand it I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. Don't do it. No. Yeah, because look, if they do Survivor, they're going to have to pay like royalties to Survivor or whatever. They will just call it something else. You don't f***ing have to. <laughs> I mean, you probably have to make it like fundamentally different. You can't just rename it. Like, what if someone made this show and just called it something else? I mean, go ahead. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> I mean, don't steal my content. Don't steal Danny's words. Don't re-upload my videos. Don't be a piece of sh**. But yo, I mean, there's probably a reason no one's stolen this format because it's not very good. <laughs> but it's a different story in the rest of the world where perhaps the most famous and most dangerous reality show in history has enjoyed runs in over 50 international variants and none were more successful than the US version, which first launched in 2000 and is still fighting fit today after an incredible 41 seasons. Whoa, they do two seasons a year? Oh my god, you're spinning that money, dudes! I love it! <laughs> <What's that now? laughs> I'm rich. 
Inspired by the original 1997 Swedish version, Expedition Robinson. I like that. I love that Swiss Family Robinson as a quit as a kid. The did I just as a squid? I didn't used to be a squid. You what? The show takes a bunch of woefully inexperienced contestants who never tried anything much more adventurous than setting up a tent in their own back garden. It splits them up. It splits them. Excuse me, what are you doing? It splits them up into tribes and dumps and dumps. Are you sober now? No, no, yeah. yeah. I, I never, but I, I'm on to, uh, to, uh, And dumps them all onto a remote, exotic island where they have to fend for themselves for up to 39 days. That does actually sound really hard. I've never seen Survivor. Of course I haven't. I, I generally don't like reality TV. I think it's quite bad. I've made fun of various reality TV shows that I've got sucked into on Netflix, like f***ing um, Marriage or Mortgage. Objectively a terrible television program, but you're like, oh my god, I want to know. Are they going to choose Marriage or Mortgage? And you're like, who the f*** cares? But some I'm still watching this. And I'm like, is there a new season? Where's the new season? Did you cancel it, at Netflix? Do I want it back? <laughs> Marriage or mortgage? Don't watch it, it's really bad. No, I don't think I will. <laughs> it's also not. <laughs> you have a poison in your mind, and the fact that you can't see it makes me so sad. Along the way, they have to put themselves through their paces with a string of tough physical endurance tests and stroppily vote each other off the island until there's one person standing, the sole survivor, who scoops up the pretty impressive one million dollar grand prize. I mean, all of this stuff is pretty impressive, except when you realize then who wants to be a millionaire is coming along and all you have to do is answer 15 questions. And I know obviously none of the idiots on Survivor would be able to do this because they wouldn't be able to get to the thousand dollar question. Um, but it's like, that show is basically giving a million dollars away every episode. And Survivor's like, we do it twice a year. <laughs> and they probably get great ratings and they're probably just making an absolute fucking killing. <laughs> Love it! My capitalist heart beats for you, Survivor. <laughs> a quick tip though, if you do become the winning soul survivor, don't forget to inform the Internal Revenue Service about your windfall. The winner of the first season, Richard Hatch, decided not to bother doing this, which was a bit silly as he was spotted picking up his cash prize on TV by an audience of around 50 million people. 50 million people watch this shit. Aren't there like 300 million people in America? That's nuts. Richard was found guilty of falsely reporting his earnings to the IRS and sentenced to over four years in prison. Oh my dude, come on now. What an idiot. Oh, what a loser. Good. Good. More for me and you. Maybe just read on the internet. In the UK, I don't think. Don't take this as advice. <laughs> but like, if you win like a prize like this, it's like gambling or whatever. So uh, maybe it's not gambling. But you don't have to pay taxes on gambling in the UK, apparently, which is quite nice. The hosts of these dangerous reality shows usually tend to be overseeing the shit show from a relatively safe position. On the UK version of I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, the cheeky chappy hosts stand to the deck are often scoffing on cheese and biscuits in the safety of the studio whilst introducing the next segment, in which a celebrity from yesteryear is encouraged to throw themselves into a pit of live snakes. In the Australian outback. Don't do it! But Jeff Probost, the host of the US version of Survivor, seems just as likely as the contestants to fall victim to a mishap. Of course, the contestants have racked up their own fair share of injuries over the years. Just 17 minutes into the very first episode, Jeff, I don't know how to say your surname, Probost, appeared to be strangely excited and proud when he revealed to viewers, We have our first injury! And everyone was like, You psycho. <laughs> Ah, legal team. Someone could get hurt. Have I made myself clear? The first one was a dislocated shoulder. It was the very first of many injuries. Over the course of those 41 seasons, contestants have suffered from fractured limbs, blackouts, leg punctures, scratched corneas, and near fatal heat stroke. There was also one notable incident where a contestant fell into a campfire and burned his hand so badly that the skin started oozing off before his eyes. Dude. 
Not okay. But at least the contestants usually only have to endure one life-threatening catastrophe. Jeff Probus seems to be a serial offender. During the very first season, he got stung by a jellyfish right in the groin. Oh, and I don't like this show. It's just people getting their hands burned off and jellyfish stinging their penises. Ah. <laughs> But maintained his professionalism and cool by only screaming out in agony after the cameras had stopped rolling. <laughs> While filming the third season in Kenya, he also managed to get stung by a scorpion which had climbed into his boot and planted the sting right on his Achilles heel. Jeff later, lam later lamented, he was about an inch and a half long and stung like a motherfucker. Yeah, dude. It was a fucking scorpion. One of the most serious incidents occurred in 2004 when Jeff attempted to slice a coconut. Well... Oh, this is not going to be good. When he sliced a coconut with a machete and ended up accidentally slashing his own wrist. Oh, dude. That is like shivering bad. One of the local islanders from F8 in Vanuatu had been showing off the tricks of the trade to Jeff, and this included spinning a coconut round in circles and while slicing it to bits with a machete. Jeff clearly thought that any old idiot could learn this skill in minutes, but it turns out that that's not quite true. Why would you think that, Jeff? What is wrong with you? <laughs> Jeff clearly thought that any old idiot could learn this skill in minutes, but it turns out it's not quite true. The loincloth islander handed over his machete. The loincloth islander handed over his machete to let eager Jeff have a go, but on Jeff's first attempt, the blade glanced off the coconut and opened up his wrist, leading to a massive spurt of blood. And the very green and dizzy Jeff stomping feebly onto the rocks. <laughs> Dude, just don't, don't do it. What are you up to? The wound eventually healed, but the doctors later told Jeff that it was a close call. And perhaps the funniest incident occurred in 2002 when Jeff managed to get covered in his own electrified piss. Ah, uh, waiting for an explanation on that, Danny. This one's going to be good. That season was filmed at Herbert River in Queensland, Australia, and the production team had erected an electric fence to keep out any troublesome kangaroos, not realizing, oh no, he's going to piss an electric fence. Jeff, what are you up to? You maniac. <laughs> Not realizing that the fence was electric, Jeff had decided it'd be a good spot in which to discreetly relieve himself, but was shocked in more ways than one when he found out that the fence was spitting his pee right back at him. This could have been really nasty. If the urine doesn't have time to separate into individual droplets, an electric current could potentially travel right back up the stream to the source and, well, you really don't want that to happen. Absolutely no shit. Oh my god, would it like electrocute inside your bladder and shit? Like, getting electrocuted inside your body has got to be really unpleasant. And up your penis. <clears throat> Cock shot! <laughs> oh, penis! Poor wife! Jeff recovered from the shark and later admitted that he'd never even heard of an electric fence. Jeff, what are you talking about? Who's never heard of an electric fence? You know they exist in theory! You've seen Jurassic Park, Jeff! He said, I didn't realize what it was. I'm from Kansas. And we don't have electric fences in Kansas. Yeah, and I don't have electric fences in my office. But I'm aware that these things can exist. Nobody ever died on the US version of Survivor despite Jeff's blatant death wish. But you can't say the same about the other international variants. No, people died on Survivor? <laughs> A terrible double tragedy took place in 2013 in the French edition known as Koh Lanta. During the very first day of filming the 16th season in Cambodia, contestant Gérard Babin began complaining of cramps during the first tug-of-war challenge and then collapsed into the sand. The 25-year-old was initially treated for dehydration at a local infirmary before an attempt was made to airlift him to hospital. En route to the hospital, Gerard suffered a cardiac arrest and died from what was described in his autopsy as heart failure. Now, it would appear that Gerard may have had an undetected heart condition for which the show couldn't really be held responsible, particularly as they'd literally only just started filming the season, which was scrapped entirely following the tragedy. The rest of the contestants are going to be really disappointed they're not going to win their million euros or whatever. Also, if you're going to be going and doing this, aren't they giving you a fairly thorough medical checkup before you go? I would think so. Maybe it just wasn't detected? However, the family of Gerard took a different view, fueled by claims of an insider on the show who reckoned that Gerard's medical treatments were much delayed not to interfere too much with filming, and that an airlift transfer was initially deemed too costly. Don't you have insurance for that shit? 
how how are you not giving these people a proper medical before the show goes on and you're also not insured for like airlift you smoking crack oh shit i'm sorry a criminal investigation into manslaughter was launched holy shit. but this appears to have been dropped after gerard's family reached a financial settlement with the production company which was undisclosed but was reportedly a multi-million dollar sum well good they you know good um but also how can a criminal be case be i guess the family could have said we don't want it pursued but the police would still be like well we, we kind of want to pursue that because it's like a crime and you've got a civil settlement weird i don't know french law could be odd the story doesn't end there though following the controversial accusations in the media that the production had been negligent in its medical care for gerard the show's long-serving onside dr thierry costa committed suicide oh that's really sad it's not i mean it's not his is it i don't know it doesn't hmm. what the fuck are you talking about his suicide note reveals that he felt his name and reputation had been sullied by the media that particular season may have been called cool, but Colanta was back again the following year and is one of 23 versions of survivor that's still on the air today the contestants and medical staff might not always make it out alive but the show lives on to fight another day disappointingly last train to canal 10 and so we return to the scene of carnage at the railroad tracks in the city of young in uruguay and find ourselves pondering how on earth it got to this point the really sad thing about this television train crash is that the makers of the reality show in question had the most honorable of intentions this wasn't about resuscitating the flagging careers of sealess celebrities or getting contestants to eat kangaroo testicles in the name of entertainment it's really weird what people find entertaining in case you haven't noticed i'm weird i'm a weirdo have you ever seen me without this stupid hat on that's weird the show in question was produced for channel 9 or canal 10 and it went under the name de fe de, de safio al corazon which roughly translates as challenge to the heart hosted by that famous uruguayan megastar umberto de vargas i have no idea if daddy's being sarcastic as umberto de vargas could be mega famous or he could be nobody who knows i don't know you and i don't care to know you Bitch, I don't know your life. The show visited small Uruguayan communities, encouraged everyday townsfolk to participate in fun chess tests and challenges, which would help raise big money for local charities and facilities. This sounds like a good reality TV show, rather than just like a bunch of vain people hoping to win a million dollars. In 2006, the show traveled to the city of Young, about 235 miles west of the capital of Montevideo. 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 I have no idea on a mission to raise the equivalent of thirty thousand dollars for the local hospital which was in dire need of heating and the challenge this week was a test of strength in which around 50 of the small populations <clears throat> in which around 50 of the small population's strongest men were invited to undertake a journey of just 75 meters the twist in the test was that the engine of the locomotive would be very much switched off the challenge was to manually pull the train and the two attached carriages with ropes the men would keep going all the way down the railroad tracks until they hit the target of 75 meters which represented the exact number of years in which medical staff had been freezing their knackers off in the hospital at El young as the tv crew from channel 10 arrived a crew of over 2,000 people turned up to enjoy the spectacle including all those school kids who've been allowed to bunk off school for the day one minor problem was that it just happened to be pissing down with rain on their day making conditions pretty slippery also it's alleged that the test of strength was prematurely kicked off about 10 minutes too early without warning or adequate preparation oh shit, i'm sorry the situation plunged into chaos when a big bunch of overexcited onlookers decided to jump over the flimsy security fence and give the contestants a helping hand. Differing reports from the local press suggest that somewhere between 70 and 300 extra members of the crowd took it upon themselves to get involved in the fun challenge and grab a hold of some of the ropes, including women and several of the school children. Oh my god, is this train gonna like crash into them or something horrible? The big issue now was the drizzly conditions that had led to the train picking up far more speed than anyone has expected as the contestants towed it down the tracks and the problem was further confounded by the uninvited participants who were giving it even more welly predictably many people began to fall under the wheels of the oh my god this is not right of the wheels of the speeding locomotive leading to an unexpected bloodbath as the unfortunate citizens of young were crushed to death 
by the giant metal beast, while legs and arms of ver- and various other limbs started bouncing off the rail tracks. Oh my god, that is savage. There were a total of eight recorded deaths, including a child and one 64-year-old man who died from a heart attack after watching his wife get crushed to death under the wheels. Many more people were rushed to the very same hospital for which they were supposed to be fundraising to receive treatment, and in some cases, their limbs amputated. And it was still pretty cold on that accident in emergency ward. All this carnage was, of course, observed by those 1,200 deeply traumatized school children who were to receive a surprisingly dark lesson on bunk, not bunking off school. Holy shit. Bunk off school. There will be death. Death. Somebody's going to die tonight. Oh no, God! At first, the only person to be held responsible for the disaster was the driver of the train, though I wouldn't have thought the train needed much driving. He was eventually acquitted of all charges in 2009. After a 12-year legal battle, the family of one of the deceased did receive a substantial settlement from both Channel 10, and for reasons we can't begin to fathom, the state-run health subsidiary ASSE. Possibly pronounced ass. <laughs> I am disgusted. The family used some. It's not appropriate place for a joke, fact, boy. The family used some of the money to buy an ambulance for a different hospital in the village of Greco, so Hospital Del Young still missed out on any benefit. Thirty-six years on from that fatal bungee jump on the Late Late Breakfast Show, dangerous reality TV shows around the world show no sign of running out of steam any time soon as the TV networks strive to deliver ever more potentially perilous thrills and spills for our viewing pleasure. I suspect. We're on schedule for an even bigger train wreck in the not-too-distant future at a line crossing that should have never been constructed. But boom boom This has been an episode of Brain Blaze. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, use that like button. If you disliked it, which, uh, you know, you might do. It's a new format. Go ahead and press that dislike button. No one can see you. Ha! And I'll see you next time. Don't see Moonfall. Or see it. it. It's not even one of those movies where it's so shit that you end up enjoying it. It's just not enjoyable in any fucking way. I can't believe I didn't just stop watching it halfway through. It's been 84 years.